she just about said it. Um, no, I, uh, when I was here at Whittier, I was much, she said I was a little bit different. I was much like you guys. I was more interested in trying to get the full college experience. I uh, was, I'm an Altagonian, so I did Pledge of Society, but I did that a little bit late in my career. I uh, started out playing football, went through as a resident advisor, all the while still going to class and doing what I need to do every day. I was pre-med from the moment I stepped on campus, and I used all of these skills to become where I am today, and I'll tell you about that. So what I did was I went to uh, University of Kansas in Kansas City for medical school. And once I got into medical school, I tried to decide how I was going to pay for, for that. I didn't uh, come from a family where we had a lot of financial background, a large financial background. So I decided to take a scholarship from the Army. And so they paid my uh, entire way through medical school. And after I got out of medical school, I served, paid back that same time. They paid for four years. And I served for about 10 years, but four years that was in payback. But during that time, I was still a physician. I trained in what's called internal medicine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the different specialties that there are out there. But internal medicine is your, your adult doctor. What we do is we, him being a cardiologist, we probably started out on the same, same track. You start out becoming an adult doctor, and from that, you will try to decide if you want to subspecialize in something else. Um, I chose to do nephrology. Who knows what nephrology is? What's nephrology? Uh, what's your name? Fred. Fred, what's nephrology? This study of the kidneys, right? Study of the kidneys, that's very good. Because usually when I say nephrology, this is what I get. <laughs> <laughs> so people kind of turn their head and they wonder, they never say, but why do, you, why do they call it kidneyology or something like that? But uh, Nephrology is what it's called because the functional unit of the kidney is called a nephron, so that's where it comes from. Okay? So I chose that just because I decided within myself how I actually learned. And I usually learn by understanding things, and that happened to be a specialty where you really have to understand a lot of things and not a lot of memorization. So as you go along in your career here and forward, you really got to start looking at yourself and the way you learn and the things that make you happy, the things that make you excited when you're trying to choose what you want to do, okay? Um, now, I got out of the military about six months ago. So, this is all new to me. I uh, was wearing fatigues every day to work for the last 10 years, and so I, I had to go shopping. So, um, now I work at Western University in Pomona. And I don't know who's heard of Western University. It looks like all you guys are interested in healthcare field. So, what you need to know about Western University is they have nine colleges there that are all related to healthcare fields. Okay? So I happen to work in the medical school portion of that college. But we do have uh, Allied Health, which uh, trains PAs, and we have uh, physical therapists that go through there. We have a graduate nursing program, optometry, podiatry, dentistry. And I know I'm going to forget one, but the point is there are nine colleges. And if you're, if you're interested in any of them, you come through Western University. So I don't only teach, I also, we also have a group medical practice uh, we call the Western Diabetes Institute. Since diabetes affects the kidneys, it can affect a lot of organs in the body, we have created a multi-specialty group to kind of to address that. And so we have a practice, I, we work at Pomona Valley Hospital, and then I teach on the side. So, um, if you guys have any questions about any of those things, feel free after this to come up and talk to me about it.
But he, like I think you're going to find all of these gentlemen tonight, uh, was very, very focused, very good student on the dean's list. Um, and then he's going to tell you how he ended up becoming a physical therapist. Um, you don't have to stay at this time. <laughs> um, so, graduated in 2005. So, just had my five reunion two weeks ago, I think. Came back here, it was pretty cool. Um, initially came to Whittier and wanted to teach, is what I thought, going to education. So, I started down a child development track. Um, finished that whole first year and decided to do an internship at Broad Oaks. We were in a classroom with 20 kids. It lasted about a month. And decided I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, I like it one on one, not 20 on one. Um, so I ended up taking a class, uh, Functional Anatomy is what it was called. And it kind of, that's kind of what really sparks my interest for, towards physical therapy and kinesiology. Um, just the way my brain worked, I liked the idea of levers and pulleys and the anatomy. Kind of, everything just kind of made sense. Um, so I started going down that track and took the biomechanics and the their ex classes. Just really enjoyed it. Um, graduated with the pre physical therapy um, emphasis and moved on to PT school at Azusa Pacific. Um, three year program there for your doctorate. Um, when I graduated, I went in to, uh, to work for Kaiser. Worked for about a month before I realized I enjoyed being in school and uh, wanted to do more. Um, unlike with the uh, the MDs, when you finish, you kind of have to choose you go down a residency track, fellowship tracks to specialize. Uh, with PT, you educate, um, you get your neuro routines, your ortho residencies, your PEs, everything kind of in school, and then when you're done, you're done, and you just practice everything, um, which I didn't really like. I'd rather specialize in one thing. But so after working with Kaiser for a month, I got accepted to a residency program that specialized in uh, orthopedic manual therapy. So I did that for a year. Um, and then afterwards, you can apply and take a test to become a certified in orthopedics, which is what I did. Um, and so then again, I started, started working again for another month and realized there's still more out there. I want to do more. So I went into a, a fellowship that kind of focused on movement science and the dynamics of throwing and sports. And, and that's kind of what I'm doing now. And it ends in uh, December. It'll be over with. Uh, so currently still with Kaiser, where I work, but I'm also in these programs where you take classes on the weekends and you sit in with... Um, so a lot of my patients, we kind of co-treat with the sports med docs or with um, PM and R docs. We, we kind of treat together. We triage patients who would best fit um, they need an injection, who would best fit surgery or best fit physical therapy versus getting kind of um, these run where they sometimes see many doctors or they kind of end up where they need to go. Um, so I really enjoy that kind of sitting in with colleagues and discussing patients and that. Um, but you wouldn't be able to do that without kind of some of the extra stuff that you need. Some of the other things about physical therapy-wise, um, I enjoy the one-on-one -on -one contact. Every patient I get to see for about 30 to 40 minutes, about once a week. Um, at Kaiser and other clinics, you're seeing them sometimes two to three times a week, but with just the numbers alone, you see them about once a week. And I enjoy that. You know, I'm not sure. Um, at least when I see my primary care, it's maybe once every six months to a year. Being younger and healthier, you don't see them that often. Um, but I really get to know my patients, and I get to understand kind of there are problems, and you have a little empathy, and that stuff goes a long way, especially coming from a liberal arts school. You have multiple classes you're taking. You're learning different cultural roles. I mean, I took a Japanese class, and I took an African history class, and so you have all these different things. that becomes um, an important part of discussing with patients for that long every single time. Um, yeah, uh, so with physical therapy now, California is one of nine states that still practices with a physician referral. So uh, in the doctorate system, I think about 10 years now, they've been actually doing doctorates in physical therapy. Before it was a master's, and before that was just a bachelor's. Um, but with the doctorate, uh, they have a bunch of multiple systems, classes, and you're taking some diagnostic reasoning and imaging stuff, x-rays, MRIs, um, that you're able to kind of be a primary care off the street for um, musculoskeletal problems. Um, California still isn't one of those, it's going through a lot of regulation now. But um, to me, it's pretty important that I could go out to New Mexico or Colorado and see patients that I see are appropriate for physical therapy, if not refer to physicians. But if they're appropriate, you can still see them and treat them one-on-one -on -one and give them the care they need without sometimes seeing five or six um, or two or three other physicians or patient management before they actually end up in physical therapy. Um, so I enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and I 
feel like going through all these extra residencies and fellowships really helps your clinical reasoning, um, which is something you don't get that much of in school because you're just trying to learn as much as you can, absorb, memorize everything. Um, yeah. so.
and each one of them told me about what they did and what their job was comprised of. And I became fascinated because the job was not just, you not only had to understand business, you had to understand law. You got to work with very, very competent, intelligent, well-educated physicians and nurses and therapists and pharmacists, very dedicated people who were in their profession because they wanted to help people. That was the kind of environment that I wanted. Just coincidentally, the University of Wisconsin was starting a master's program in hospital administration the very next year, so I applied to that and got accepted. The things that I love about my job is the diversity of tasks that I do every day. I have a schedule, so I kind of know what meetings I have to go to. But if you were to ask me on an average day to predict what I was going to do, um, I wouldn't be able to tell you. It's that diverse. And as I said, you work with some very interesting people. There are, if you were to ask me, what's the one thing you, a lot of misconceptions about working in a hospital, and that is when we, we talk about working in a hospital, the first things you think about are doctors, nurses, therapists, pharmacists. There are a whole, literally almost hundreds of different types of jobs that can accommodate just about everyone's interest. The, if you are interested in information technology, there's a huge future in healthcare. If you're interested in business, just general business management, there are lots of opportunities in the hospital setting. You don't have to have a medical background in order to qualify for those jobs. Um, there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of those types of jobs in the hospital setting. There's also in allied health, if you're interested in the health field, don't just stop at thinking about hospitals. There are medical groups, health plans, clinics, um, home health agencies, uh, skilled nursing facilities. Again, there's a multiplicity of environments that you can work within if you're interested in being in the healthcare field. Um, I, um, the la I'll end by saying what is the the one thing you know now that you wish you would have known when you first started, and that was how little I really knew when I graduated from college. I truly believed that with my master's degree, I was going to change humanity in hospital administration. And it only took me about six months to realize how little I really knew. And I shut my mouth and stopped talking and started listening and learning. It took me about 20 years to learn it, but uh, I'm a slow learner. But that's the one advice I would pass along to you. College is an outstanding experience for you, and a liberal arts education gives you broad exposure to a lot of different aspects of life. That's going to help you immensely when you go on to your career or to graduate school. But the one thing I would ask you to, you to keep in mind is the real education about how to succeed in chosen career starts the day one of your job. Thank you very much.
most joy I get. Like Dr. Barnes, we, we took a path in, in, in our medical career where we wanted to challenge ourselves with thinking. Internal medicine is where you use your brain. They call us the, the fleas. <laughs> okay, because we just sift through all the little tiny details till we get to the answer. And that's another thing, another point I would really make clear to you. One of the biggest points I want to make, and that's always ask yourself, why? Always ask yourself, why? Why did that patient's kidney fail when they had endocarditis? Why? Okay? If you're not always challenging yourself and asking yourself, you're always going to be disappointed. And if you choose a career, whether it's in allied health or being a physician or whatever, and you don't totally enjoy it, and that's, and that's your passion and what you want to do, you will be miserable all of your life. If you choose exactly what you want to do and, and, and pick the highest peak of what you think you can do and want to do, shoot for the top. Wayne Gretzky was fond of saying, I never made a goal on a shot I didn't take. <laughs> okay? If you don't shoot for the scar, stars, you don't hit them. Okay? I came from the Dean's other list. <laughs> Not this list, this list. I went to UC Irvine right out of high school, graduated early, I was, you know, ahead of the curve, and most of the classes when I got there were actually repeat, because I had taken calculus and everything in high school, so I said, I'm going to go party, so I did, and joined a fraternity and had a lot of fun, oh, bought a restaurant, owned a restaurant for a couple of years. Finally, I got to thinking to myself, now, Mike, you wanted to be a doctor since you were two, and that's all I ever wanted to do since I was two, and I said, if you're going to really do this, better get your stuff together and put things back on track. And I started looking around and there's 400 people in my chemistry class, 400 people in my biology class, and 400 people. And they would literally sabotage your experiments. You were supposed to get the D or the L isomer of a crystal and they'd come along and put the L isomer when you were supposed to get the D isomer. That's how competitive it was at UC Irvine. So I started looking around and I looked at Redlands, I looked at Occidental, I looked at uh, Whittier, and I looked at several other places. My dad had gone to USC, and finally I decided to come here after visiting with some of the professors and some of the students, and really felt it was a great experience. Um, had some really great mentors. I don't know if Dr. Morris is still here teaching biology. He was fantastic. He was the one who always taught me a question, why? And that has really played a, a, a big role in my ability to be a good diagnostician. <clears throat> but I went from the other dean's list to the good dean's list when I was here. I played three years on the tennis team and uh, a few other things. I didn't pledge any societies because I'd already done the, the, the social thing at UC Irvine and found out how that worked. So didn't need to do that again, uh, but really pushed myself. And I was not, whoever's going into medicine or whatever career you're going into, explore all the other fields, explore the other classes. I was actually a chemistry major. And I, and I majored in chemistry, and then I, at the very last minute, I changed over to biology, and I got a minor in chemistry. I didn't want to do P-chem. But, but anyways, um, it, was a, it was a good experience. You, you always continue to challenge yourself and shoot high, um, whatever you do. I remember going through my training. I did my internal residency, internal medicine residency at like St. Louis University. Then I was a chief resident my cardiology fellowship in, in uh, Wayne State in uh, Michigan, and then I said, you know, I want to make myself an expert in all the aspects of what I do. So if I'm going to do ultrasound, echocardiography, if I'm going to do nuclear cardiology, I want to do an extra year of that. So I did an extra year of nothing but that at Tufts. And then I said, I want to be an expert in doing angioplasty and stents. I don't want to just go out and have done 20 or 30 and say, hey, I can do this. So I sought out and I looked for a spot where at the time you didn't even have to do extra training. And I went to Harvard and I, I fell in love with it. I said, I'm home. And they said, what do you mean? I said, this is where I belong. They said, you're that confident? I said, yeah. They said, okay, you're hired. I was one of 5,000 applicants for one spot. Okay, at Harvard. I was a chief interventional fellow at Beth Israel Did I belong there? Did, did I deserve to go there? No. But I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I shot for what I wanted to do. And I think I would encourage all of you to do that, whether it's you want to be, I mean, I work with all kinds of allied health personnel. 
ultrasound technicians, cardiovascular technicians in the cath lab, nurses, uh, radiology technicians uh, who operate the machines while we're doing the cast and everything else. And uh, I think all of them, I can tell the ones who don't want to be there. They're the ones who are just doing this because that's the job they got and that's what they could do. And they, they shot low, they hit their mark, but they shot low. That's not what they really wanted to do. So I would encourage you, challenge yourself and pick out what you really want to do. And even if it seems an unreachable, uh, an unattainable goal, go for it. And, and so you shoot a little, you miss, you get a little bit below it. You're still well above where you would have shot if you would have shot low. Okay, whatever you want to do. And uh, that's really all I wanted to come say, give you a pep talk on that. But uh, make sure you're choosing if you want to be a physician. You want to do it because that's your passion. You don't want to get into this field and hate it. Trust me. Then you have to deal with the administrators. No, I'm <laughs> okay? So I'll be happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you. I have to say, you are the most efficient panel. <laughs> we still have a lot of time. So, would you, before we open up for questions, would each of you just address what you think is a common misperception that people have about your field? What do you think is a myth you'd like to dispel? Can you start with me? Sure. Um, I probably think it's it's almost along the line of where Dr. Lamb was talking about, that not anybody can do it. I mean, anyone can do it. It's just being having that focused attitude and knowing that that's what you love to do and that's what you want to do. And you may have to take uh, an alternate path, like I did, you know, with choosing the military to pay for my education. Uh, but no matter what, and some of the things he explained, you, you may have to take an alternate path. But you can do it if you put your mind to it and it's what you really want to do. So I think that's, I'd say that's one of the misconceptions is that people say, well, I really, I'm not that smart or I really can't do this or, you know, it, it, it really doesn't work that way. So. <coughs> um. Physical therapy-wise, I'd say the biggest misconception is that uh, is that we're treated as techs sometimes. Um, coming out of PT school, um, again, there's all these different fields. There's inpatient, there's neurology, there's, um, and there's a lot of. When I chose orthopedics, um, my first month it was I see a lot of patients that have rotator cuff surgery, and it's just a protocol sometimes with you know don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and it's kind of written by the surgeons, and you follow it. And like you know, I was like, well, I don't really want to just sit here and follow orders the whole time. Um, and that's where I started looking into more clinical reasoning stuff, like the residencies and fellowships. Um, and so now I'm at the point um, in my young career where I, the doctors call me up and say, you know, this guy has hip pain, not sure what's going on, can you diagnose and treat him? Shoulder pain. So I don't necessarily see the um, more tech patients, I guess, per se. I'm not doing modalities. I'm not doing um, following protocols. I'm much more clinical reasoning and using more of my brain to figure out what impairments and what the things can be. Um, and so that kind of sets me apart from most physical therapists they say too as far as um, with the extra stuff. Well, I would think uh, in my particular field of hospital administration, probably the biggest misconception that I encounter is that you can be a very good hospital administrator uh, without ever having any kind of clinical experience. Now, it's true that you can be an outstanding hospital administrator without being a physician or a nurse or a physical therapist. But if you don't understand how care is given in the hospital, you will be constantly at a disadvantage. I was fortunate when I went through my master's program, I had to also serve a concurrent residency at a hospital or some other healthcare facility. And I was given a job at a Catholic hospital uh, in Madison, St. Mary's. And the CEO was a nun, and she, it became very apparent after about hearing me speak two sentences that I needed to have some clinical experience. And she continued to pay me for my administrative residency, but made me an orderly. And I was an orderly for nine months. And so I changed bedpans, I changed dressings, um, I took blood pressures, temperatures, I worked alongside nurses, I got to see and experience what it was like to come to 
work every day and take care of patients. And to this day, and I mean this without any exaggeration, it is the most was one of the most gratifying job I've ever had, and it is the, and the most important <coughs> experience in making me a better hospital administrator because I have a sense of. Physicians in general and for cardiologists and especially interventional cardiologists are doing some of the high-tech, really expensive procedures. I think the one of the most common misconceptions is that we're super wealthy. <laughs> right? Talk to Medicare. So anyways, um, it, it, it's not about the money. I mean, I went back to my 10 or 15 year high school reunion and there was a lot of people who went into their career because Exceptions are that it's somehow a glamorous job, and it's not. It's not. It's a mess. And it's ugly sometimes. It's dirty sometimes. Um, and you get blood and gore and guts all over you. Um, and that uh, somehow we're these, you know, extraterrestrial, brilliant people. We're not. And as you admitted, uh, uh, mentioned earlier ago, is uh, you know how you feel like you just know a small amount. I tell. My wife, I say every day, I learn something new. I know how much more I don't know. It's just another tip of another iceberg, and I got to study that much harder and learn. And you got to constantly be learning and challenging yourself. Otherwise, it's no longer enjoyable for you. And you got to, you got to want to do it. Kind of adding to what he said, you know, I, I work with medical students every day, and you know, they're about halfway through their medical school training, and I start working with them. Uh, if you do it for money, you won't make it through that. I mean, you just won't. It's very difficult. I mean, it's very hard. If it's something you really love to do and what you want to do, that's what's going to take you through. Because there's other ways to make money. I mean, this is, it's really, if you want to go into a health profession, I mean, it, you really have to love what you, what you do. So. But if you do, there's nothing better. Exactly. <laughs> well, now we'll just open it up to the audience. changed a lot, you know, since I took it. I mean, we still use paper and a pencil. I don't know if they still do that now. Yeah. And, and I know, and then we had to write a few essays and things like that. So I think it may have changed a little bit, but uh, that that was the part of the process that I think was a, one of the bigger humps coming from uh, college, which, especially uh, liberal arts, you learn a lot of different things. And then you really have to focus a lot on science uh, when you're studying for that exam. Um, it was challenging, but doable. I think there's a, a couple keys as you go through, if, if you're interested in going into medicine, that, that you learn along the way, and I don't know about you, but I learned this early on. That was one of the first places I noticed it. And it was true to form through every test I took, whether it was my uh, state boards or whether it was uh, uh, licensing exams or USM. Board certifications. And that's one of the things 
they're testing on you is not only how smart you are, but your ability to problem solve. And they're going to test you until the point when they know you are burnt out. And they're going to start that book with a nice, easy, match this, match that, fill in the you know best choice, A, B, C, or D. And then you start going into more complex questions and more complex questions, and all of a sudden you're doing it. K types where answer A is 1, 2, and 3 are true, answer B is 1 and 3, C is 2 and 4, D is 4 only, E is all the above, you know, and you're like, holy smoke. So you're answering four or five questions, and they're not just what I would call primary questions. They're not, what is a nephron? They're saying, you know, in, in, in this particular illness with this particular drug and this particular half-life and nephrons working at this functioning level, what would you expect? To happen to that organ, you're like, holy smokes, you're all right. Those ways down the. So, so what I always did, so what I always did, and there's no rule against it, is when your brain is dead tired at that time, start at the back of the book. Your brain's the freshest. I did my MCATs that way. Start at the back of the book where the hardest questions are. When your brain is fresh, by the time your brain is drained and dead. Can't think anymore. Now you're getting to the easy questions. I got 12 some years cast, uh, and that was that. And the 375 out of here, and three years NCAA tennis and Eagle Scout. I didn't get an interview, so I can't tell you anything about that. But I can tell you that I just they accepted me. But the um, the interviews I heard other people talk about, where there's some some things you want to avoid, and maybe you can you can help with that too. But Ask you, you know, why do you want to be a doctor? Well, I want to help people. Okay, so why don't you be a garbage man? <laughs> they help people. They pick up their garbage. You take it away. Doesn't stink up their house. No. And a good liberal arts training will give you that sort of expanded knowledge to realize, you know, you know, this is this is what I really want to do. Whatever whatever your chosen field is, and and you'll and you'll have gotten exposed to a whole lot of different things um, and be able to more intelligently answer that kind of a question. And, uh, what we well, I mean, kind of what he was saying about the interview, I mean, you really should, the best thing you could do is talk about someone else. Because you were actually you were giving examples of where you saw someone being helped rather than saying, I want to help people. And then you can bring it back to yourself saying, this is, I saw this happening and I knew this is exactly what I wanted to do rather than saying a statement like that. But it, it becomes more unique or more true when you actually have stories attached to them uh, that you've observed. But showing, but again, showing your passion by seeing what somebody else was doing and, and that that's what you became passionate for. That's what's going to carry you through any career. Did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, this is this is maybe a bit of a different question. I've only recently realized that I'm more interested in studying physiology of the human body as a whole and perhaps in a, in a healthcare role. I'm a psych major at the moment and I've spent the past four years studying receptor subtypes and monoamine transporters in kind of a very different niche. I'm worried that I've pigeonholed myself to that track now, even if I'm interested in pursuing this path. What I, path you? Uh, I guess, I mean, internal medicine as a whole is very interesting. Uh, the role of the physician, I think. I don't know if I know enough about specific physiology to declare a specialty at this point. I think medical schools are looking for more well-rounded uh, applicants nowadays than they are the one who goes the straight biology major pathway and does all the prerequisites along the way. They like art majors, they like history majors, as long as you have the prerequisites. You got the organic camp, you got all the other classes. But they want more of a well-rounded individual who's going to become more of a well-rounded doctor. Just make sure you've got all your prerequisites. And, and you can say, hey, I like this. I found this fascinating. Who knows? Maybe I want to be a psychiatrist. I went to medical to. school with philosophy majors, history majors. Yes. And Excellent. Those are a lot more often psychology. So. Uh, could you maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more about what you're saying about uh, how the bar misconception is? So in, in a place in California, in order to in order to uh, bill insurance for patients, you need a referral from an MD. So the MD refers uh, a script that says, you know, 
constraint, and sometimes they say do this, this, this. And so um, we write our notes up, you treat the patient according to the MD, and then you send it back for, for signature. Um, and that's how California practices. One of the, I think there's one, one of the nine states that still kind of does that format. Um, and so you very much kind of follow orders. You know, this is what you do. This is what based mostly been written by um, protocols and things research based um, on this. But uh, it's not necessarily that way when you get down to the level of it. A lot of times it comes down to calling physicians or um, them calling you and just saying, you know, not sure what's going on. You got to even actually go through an evaluation, watch. Um, physical therapists are the movement specialists. Um, so they sit there, watch how they do their things, they move, check muscle length, test joint movement, joint mobility, um, to see what's causing some of their symptoms. Because sometimes it may be, you know, that hip strain, but why did they strain their hip or they're having some nerve root compression and stuff, and well, why is there, yeah, so kind of like saying it's, it's why, so it's not just treating the diagnosis per se, but kind of actually peeling back layers to why it's happening, you know. Most commonly, it's not trauma. You know, there are these ACL football players and this and that, but most commonly, it's just a positional movement fault that we have that cause our symptoms. So a lot of the times, the um, physical therapists are the ones that do the diagnostic for the um, to, a, to a point, yeah. Not necessarily in California as much, um, unless you have that role with the physician, that where I've kind of built myself into that role by going up to and, and discussing cases with them a lot of times. You know, I'm very, a little more outspoken when it comes to that. That's kind of where I've actually been able to sit in treatment rooms with them while they do their diagnosis, their, um, their evaluation, and they have me do my evaluation on the same patient, and we discuss different cases and this, that, and that. And that's really kind of what saved me from staying in PT, because when I first started afterwards, I um, I enjoyed PT school, I loved it, but then when I got out, I didn't really, didn't enjoy my acute, my inpatient rotation, where I kind of um, would go and I'd walk patients around the hospital and this, that. And I just felt like, you know, I wasn't really using my brain or thinking as much as what I wanted to do. Um, and so I was like, you know, this is what it's going to be for the next 25 years. I'm not, I'm not going to be happy. Um, so that's where I was like looking into other ways. And the residency was absolutely amazing. It's just totally based on clinical reasoning. You have mentors. You have, um, you see difficult patients. Um, they book special slots for you. We have more time. You just kind of um, really try to work on your diagnostic, physical therapy diagnostic, not necessarily. challenging yourself, continually stimulating yourself, continually thinking. <coughs> and it, one, myth, one thing I wanted to say earlier that I forgot to say, and that's always be humble. Whatever you do. I, I tell my wife all the time, I say, if I ever come home and say I know everything there is to know about cardiology, I want you to shoot me. <laughs> then I'm going to kill somebody. Okay? And if, if you're not humble, life will humble you. And you're going to be this great orthopedic surgeon at, you know, great white towers and some physical therapist is going to come up to you and go, uh, doctor, you screwed up the diagnosis, this is what it is. And if you're not humble enough to say, thank you, you're right, you're going to be the one who's going to be suffering in the long run. You know, you take input from everyone around you. None of us are technicians and none of us are, you know, complete experts on anything we do. We're always learning from each other and from life. I learn from administrators. I learn And, and from the physical therapist, from the from the uh, uh, respiratory therapist. But if you're a person who just is going to be content for the rest of your life, like Fred Flintstone just pulled the thing on the bird and it's clock in and clock out of the home, uh, you know you're not going to be happy. You got to be always stimulating and challenging yourself to whatever you do. Which brings up a point about the allied health field is that you're not just Separate their students and they work in groups to 
solve cases together as their physical therapist, as the dentist, as the podiatrist, as the physician, as the graduate nursing program person. It's, they all get this case and they work through it together to see it's that team approach. And obviously it takes humility all around uh, to go through this, especially when you're just learning all this information. So everyone's an important part of the team. quarterback is going to get sacked every time if there's not someone in the line, right? And if there's nobody to throw the ball to. So somebody wants to be a wide receiver. Somebody wants to be a tackle. Somebody really has a passion for being a center. Somebody wants to be a running back. So somebody wants to be a quarterback. But it's all part of a team, and it's all necessary for all of us to work closely together. And that's, you know, I think that's a really important part of the whole thing is a team work part of it. And you're all you Everybody in, in the Allied Health field is part of a team, and if you're being, if you're doing the part that you really want to do, you're going to do it well. I would, I would ask um, all of you, Dennis, you in particular, but all of you gentlemen, manage healthcare. You're all coming in the medical field at different decades of life. How would you say that manage the changes in managed healthcare? Changed your field or changed how you do business, how you practice, or how you administer uh, in the hospital? Um, it's taught you how to deal with frustration, <laughs> <laughs> anger management, <laughs> conflict <laughs> resolution. <laughs> no, I think the one good thing that perhaps came out of managed care is that um, the cost of health care. So they held on to their patient for a really long time. So by the time they got to me, they were STS. And you know what that means. Sicker than anyway. <laughs> Anyways, you know, and and, and 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 for me to take care of them the way they really needed to be taken care of was unfortunately for the hospital administrators very cost ineffective. Because now I'm having to go into all three arteries, put in five, eight stents, and they and they've got one DRG pile that they've got to pay for all this equipment out of. 
But I think that, you know, the, the key is in, in what everybody tries to do and what really, and I, I, as the chief resident, when I was training the residents, the interns, and medical students, I taught them, was if, if you practice medicine well and you, and you do a good job, it is inherently medical, legally sound. You don't need to worry about the lawyers. If you've done it and it's evidence-based medicine and you're following the, you know, the current trials and the current outcomes and everything else and you're staying up on the literature, it's inherently medical, legally sound. You don't have to go as the administrators complaining at you, why did you order 15 ultrasounds and x-rays and all these CAT scans and MRIs? Because the guy had a hurt toe. Oh, I guess his nail in his toe didn't tip you off. You know, okay. So you don't have to order a bunch of extra tests just to protect yourself. And besides being inherently medically legally sound, it's inherently cost effective. Okay. So I think if you if you practice good medicine, it is inherently sound. But medic managed care is a pain. Yeah, I think I think the focus. services because then the, the joy gets drawn out a little bit of doing what you love and taking care of the patient. Um, but the, the difficulty is finding and defining that word quality and how do we measure quality. And that's where we've had a lot of difficulty because it, quality care is what we should be getting paid on. Not, hey, I ordered five lab tests and, uh, you know, and did this exam. and did it Because you're going to have the tendency to do more to make more money, rather than the strive to make your patients healthier. And so that word quality is where we're probably, I think we're all getting stuck, trying to figure out what quality, how do you value quality. So. And some of that extra cost is, is driven by fear. Right. Fear of the lawyers and fear of, you know, somebody coming after you. But uh, again, if you, do it, if you do the right thing, practice good medicine, going to be safe, whatever you're doing. There's always going to be somebody complaining. <laughs> complaining. You did the right thing. And you know in your heart you did the right thing. And you can sleep at night. Well, on that, I'd like us all to give a round of applause to our guests.